Hi everyone, my name is Gaurav Gelot. I am a developer advocate at InfraCloud Technologies. Uh, outside work, I am a Docker community leader and I also organize multiple meetup groups in Pune. Uh, if you're happy to connect with me, I'll be available at uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, and my own website. Great, my name is Vishal Biani. Uh, I'm CTO and founder of InfraCloud Technologies. I'm one of the fission maintainers and I'm also an active organizer of Pune Kubernetes Meetup. Uh, I am usually found on Twitter and LinkedIn, you know, uh, uh, for connecting. Cool. So today we are going to talk about auto-scaling event-driven applications with Fission and Keda. Now, before we go and understand the actual demo and the application, let's understand what Fission is. Cool. So Fission is a serverless framework on top of Kubernetes. It allows you to write functions and focus on code and not have to worry about underlying, uh, you know, details about infrastructure or Kubernetes as much. While it tries to hide the details of your know, Kubernetes and Docker from you, it doesn't completely limit you. You can you know, get to as much detail as you want, but if you don't want, you can always stay abstracted from that. And uh, you know, it does support a lot of integrations. We'll look at that in the subsequent slides. Now, what Fission can do for you? So Fission you know, is basically inherently a framework written on top of Kubernetes. It's a bunch of CRDs and controllers, and it relies heavily on Keda project for a lot of integrations with event sources or message queues or databases. Now, as a developer, you might want to write functions. You might want to write microservices. Sometimes you might want to just give source code and let Fission figure out, build, deploy, and you know, package it into a container. But sometimes you might say, hey, I will give you a container uh, and not the source code. In all of these scenarios, Fission can help you, you know, deploy and uh, run microservices or functions. Today, we support a whole bunch of languages, right? From Java, Golang, Node.js, Ruby, uh, you know, Perl, Python. We also have something called as binary environment. So people actually run shell scripts uh, for some of their operational stuff, you know, using efficient binary environment. Now, once you're deployed your functions, microservices in many of these languages onto Fission, you might of course want to call them, right? So you can call them using FTTP, obviously. You can also call them using cron. There is a cron, you know, uh, timer kind of built into Fission uh, and allows you to have uh, functions invoked periodically. Uh, it also integrates with a whole bunch of, you know, message queue resources using Keda. And today we support, for example, Amazon Kinesis, Amazon SQS, uh, Nats, Kafka, uh, and there is more connectors being added. Now, when you have a platform like this, which is executing a whole bunch of functions, microservices, which are being invoked on the fly, you want pretty detailed observability. Fission does integrate with almost all the major observability tools uh, like Elastic, Prometheus, Jaeger, Grafana, uh, to give you the visibility into what is happening in your cluster uh, you know, when, you, when you execute this uh, functions and microservices. Now, we are on GitHub, of course. Uh, you can find us on fission slash fission. Uh, please, you know, uh, star us and follow us. And if you have any uh, issues in, you know, uh, trying out something, do check out the documentation, join us on Slack, and ask questions, please. Now, if you look at a very simple Hello World uh, version of, you know, fission, basically, right? In the first line, what we are doing here is we are creating an environment of Node.js uh, runtime, and we are using the fission provided image, uh, you know, as the base image. In the second line, we are creating a function uh, called hello.js in which we are using the runtime being the node.js that we declared in the first line. And we are simply pointing to the code on a GitHub repository. Now this code line is doing just a simple hello world. And once we are done these two uh, you know, creations, we can simply call it using fission function test and you know, hello and we get a hello world. Now I'm not gonna show this simple example. You can go and check it out later on your own, but just gives you an idea that without having to understand the whole you know, details of deployments or you know, other things, uh, you are able to run a simple piece of code onto Fission. Great, so let's talk about uh, you know, the demo that we're actually gonna show you today. Now, this is a simple diagram of, of the demo you know, that I'm gonna show you. There is one function, uh, it is gonna produce messages and write into a Kafka topic called request topic, okay? Request topic is uh, subscribed by another function using a trigger. Now, trigger is a function uh, fission you know, terminology, basically, and we'll explain now what does that mean in, in subsequent slides. Now, this function will get directly the message body without having to understand or talk to fission at all. This function is going to process that message. If there is an error, it is going to put that into an error topic. And this is, again, you know, facilitated by fission. The function doesn't have to know, you know, it just has to return a response code and the response uh, body, so to speak. But if the processing is successful, it will return a 200 response and the message body, which will be put into a Kafka topic called response topic. On the response topic, there's another function which has subscribed to that topic using another trigger. And that trigger uh, you know, will invoke this function whenever there is a message in the response topic. 
This function, I guess, is going to do some more uh, reprocessing on top of that message. And it has the code to actually write the message to a RabbitMQ uh, queue. As soon as you write into the RabbitMQ queue called publisher, there's another function which has subscribed to this message queue. And when there is a message, this trigger will ensure that the message is read from the queue and actually function is invoked with the body of the message as the payload. And then the function is going to, you know, this last function is going to do something more on top of that. Right? So the first one, you are calling it Kafka producer. The second one, you are calling it Kafka consumer. The third one, we are calling rabbit producer, rabbitmq producer. And then the last one is, you know, just a consumer, a rabbitmq consumer, basically, right? Now, two of them are written in Golang, two of them are written in Node.js, uh, and, you know, we'll, we'll look at the code, of course, uh, shortly. Now, what happens is, uh, I want to explain the trigger part of it. I think it's very crucial for us to understand. Uh, technically, in normal, you know, scenarios, when you have a message queue, you have some service listening to that message queue. And that service is running always, so to speak, right? But with the Keda, the beauty is you don't run a pod always to listen to messages. As long as you have Keda running and installed, Keda is listening based on your uh, details of you know which topics to listen to, what message to listen to, and all that stuff. And only when there is a message, it'll spin up a pod. And in this case, the pod is a Keda connector. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk about Keda connector in, in subsequent slides. And this data connector will now go and read the message from the queue and call the, uh, the next function over HTTP, right? And the best part is Keda not only spins up a pod only when there is a message, it also scales out the pods when there are more messages. And the scaling is different from message queue to message queue. For example, in case of Kafka, the scaling is based on the number of partitions. Uh, in case of RabbitMQ, I'm not sure, but that is based on some other parameter, basically, right? So, uh, you know, kind of double clicking into the Keda connector part of it. So uh, a connector is nothing but a, a component which reads from one source and, you know, drops it into another extension. So when we say Kafka HTTP connector, it is reading from Kafka and dropping the message as a HTTP payload. And uh, the good part is these connectors are not specific to fission. They can be used in any context, any environment, as long as you create a pod and you set all the right parameters in terms of the, you know, destination or the source of the queue, the destination to call and stuff like that. And uh, you can always deploy a pod, but the great part is if you deploy Keda along with that and, and define the scalers you know, for that uh, specific message queue, these will be scaled out only when there are messages. right? And this is the same mechanism that we use in Fission to actually read messages when there are messages in a message queue and then scale out the number of functions as the number of messages scale into the message queue. Today, we have you know, about five, six R connectors, uh, Kafka, AWS SQS, RabbitMQ, AWS Kinesis, NATS HTTP, and there are a bunch more coming. You know, they are being uh, developed actively. Uh, so I go, you know, I suggest uh, you to go and check out this repository called Keda Connectors. Uh, very useful if you're doing anything with data processing you know, between message queues and microservices and functions, basically. All right. Coming back to the previous slide, right? So this was a part of auto scaling uh, based on uh, events happening in the message queues. So you're not consuming any resources when there are no messages. You only scale out based on demand when there are messages in the message queue, right? So that is one part of the auto scaling. The second part of the auto scaling is the actual functions. Now, all of these functions, uh, for example, two of them written in Golang, two of them written in Node.js. They are not running always. They only are, uh, you know, uh, invoked and scaled out when there are more messages coming in, right? So what we do is in Fission, there is a concept of environment. We create a small pool. So for example, for both the Go functions, we create a small pool called Go environment. And there are, let's say two or three, you know, uh, idle pods running there. And for Node.js, there are again two or three idle pods running there, which can be used by both the functions. Now, as messages start arriving, let's say the first message arrives at the first, uh, or we invoke the first function manually, right? Uh, this will be scaled if there is more like requests coming in, but potentially just one will be scaled uh, initially, right? Now the message is going to Kafka topic and the trigger gets triggered. And this trigger is again, you know, auto scaling the actual parts, which are like data connector parts. It calls the second function, uh, which is Kafka consumer. This Kafka consumer function will be scaled uh, from, uh, you know, that pool uh, with one part and then eventually to more parts as the more messages start coming in. And then it goes to underground of the Kafka topic and from there, you know, another trigger. And then again, this function is only scaled based on the flow that is coming in from this, you know, queue, so to speak, right? And, and so, so on and so forth till the end, basically. So the idea is when there are no messages, when there is no activity, technically, none of the connectors are consuming any parts, so zero. 
between the Golang and Node.js environment, we are you know, consuming about five or six pods. You can again configure this pool size to be just one or more than one, basically, right? And, and when there are messages, it might happen that each of the Keda connector pods scales, let's say, from you know, zero to one, two, or three pods. And each of the function pods, let's say, scale from nothing to, you know, let's say, two, three, four, five pods. So at its peak, there could be maybe 25, 25 hour pods running, process all the messages. Once they are done, you can scale back to zero. And that's, that's the demo you know, we are going to watch today. Cool. So let me switch the screen here and go to, first of all, VS Code and show you some code. And then we can go uh, to Terminal, try it out, and then go look at the RabbitMQ console and actually see messages coming in, basically, right? So this is our first function, Kafka producer. It's a simple Golang function. Uh, it uses a specific uh, contract you know, for the defining of the function. Uh, it's a handler function which gets a, a request and you return a response, basically, right? Uh, we connect to the Kafka queue here and we create a few random messages with timestamp and the message ID. And then we simply write it uh, back uh, you know, to the, to the uh, message queue, right? Uh, great, so that's, that's the producer function, right? Now, trigger, I don't have like, there is no code for trigger, but there is like a spec for trigger, which I can show very quickly. So all of our functions we are defining in specs. Uh, so if I show K2K trigger, for example, right? So this trigger defines, uh, you know, first of all, what is the function reference? So consumer uh, is the function to be called, right? And then it talks about which uh, Kafka server to talk to, which consumer group to talk to, which topic to listen to. And then you define also, you know, uh, polling interval and also, you know, like minimum replica count, max replica count, maximum retries and stuff like that, right? You can define all this on the CLI of fission as well, but you can also define them as a spec. Uh, it's a message to trigger, uh, you know, custom resource basically. Cool, we'll look at the producer, we'll look at one of the triggers. Now let's go look at the consumer. The first consumer uh, gets directly the message body, you know, as part of the payload, request payload. You don't have to connect to Kafka, you don't have to know anything from where the message is coming, right? So the trigger did the job of listening to that request topic. As soon as there is message, read the message, convert it into a you know specific format and post to this function as part of the request body. So all we do is get the body, we add another field called case status. So we are saying Kafka process status or something of that sort, right? To, to that uh, original message and simply returning that message. Again, when we're returning the message here, we don't know where the message is going, but that is configured in the trigger that if there is success in this function processing, please send the message to response topic. But if there is error, so if the status code would be anything other than 200, it would go to error topic, right? So the function is completely abstracted from how it gets the message and where the message goes. Right, so very de loosely decoupled. Now, when it goes to uh, the the second uh, you know topic, Kafka topic, which is the response topic, we are looking at the second trigger, which is K to R. You know, we are saying read from Kafka, but write to a RabbitMQ producer. Right, here again, you know, uh, we have configured uh, which function to call, and you know from where to read messages, what topic, and stuff like that. Right, so that will eventually call the RabbitMQ producer. Now, again, within RabbitMQ producer, we simply get the request. And the request body is what we get, right? Uh, somewhere down the line, request.body. Now, the writing part of it, of course, uh, we have to connect to, you know, RabbitMQ, you know, give some credentials and stuff. And, and that is again defined in the function specification. Uh, so if you go and look at uh, Rabbit consumer, Rabbit producer, right? So here is, you know, we are defining which Rabbit cluster to connect to and stuff like that. Uh, and it writes the body to uh, the RabbitMQ queue. Once it is done writing, the next trigger, which is uh, rabbit to function will be called. Again, here uh, it has defined, you know, what to do and all that stuff. And the actual message doesn't know anything from where the message is coming. All it does is get a message where, you know, appending one more string to the message and then returning that message, right? So that was the overall flow, you know, uh, two functions in Golang, uh, listening to Kafka topics uh, and, and uh, you know, one last one listening to RabbitMQ and so on and so forth. Great. Now, before we actually go into the demo, what I want to show you is, uh, clear up all the screens, just so that, you know, we see things a little clearly. All right. So if I go and look at, oops, yeah. You can go and look at the deployments in the default namespace. These are for three different connectors, right? The Kafka to Kafka, Kafka to Rabbit, and Rabbit to function, right? If you look at the available replicas, zero, because there is no messages coming in, all the replicas zero, right? Similarly, if I show you the HPAs, 
all of them targeting a specific deployments and, and replicas are currently zero, right? Great. Secondly, uh, if I look at the pool, the pool I was talking about, right? So I'm gonna do typical get parts and from physician function namespace. So these are the pool parts. I have three uh, pool parts for Golang as the environment and three pool parts for Node, you know, JS as the environment. But if I had to look at functions, function specific part, right? So AGPO and so rabbit producer, right? Rabbit producer function. And when you say manageable false, that is the part which is actually doing any work, right? There is, there is no part right now. Similarly, I'm gonna do K hyphen consumer. There's no part right now, right? So right now, all the resources are zero. What I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna call this producer. Now in the producer code, when we were producing the message to Kafka request topic, we were producing about 10 R messages. So I'm gonna call this function a couple of times. So it produces like 40, 50 R messages, you know? All right. Now let's look at the deployments here. As you can see, the Kafka to Kafka connector deployment has scaled from zero to one because they have messages arrived in the Kafka queue, right? Similarly, if I go look at function, the producer function has been called, which is the first function in the pipeline, right? Let me go and look at if there is any consumer function parts, you know, which have been uh, created. There is one, right? Uh, if I look at the R consumer, which is RabbitMQ, the last function, there are already four or five of them, right? And lastly, the RabbitMQ producer. All right, there is just one. So, and on the bottom, if you see all three of the triggers, the K2K, uh, K2R, and let's see if the R2F still is zero. Yeah, so now K2K has again scaled back to zero. K2R has scaled back to zero. The R2F you know, has scaled back to one. So these are all connected parts, by the way. And as you might have seen here, again, rabbit producer still one, but if you look at rabbit consumer, let's say, right? About uh, six odd parts are, are working together. And if I look at the Kafka consumer, there is just one part running still, right? Now, as the messages get processed, these six will again come back to zero. And this R2F connectors, Keda connector part will also come back to zero. Now let's go and check out in the RabbitMQ console. As you can see, we did a spike. So there are about 30 odd messages, uh, which were received or queued. And then there were, you know, others that were consumed as well, right? By different, different consumers. And uh, yeah, I think there is nothing left in the queue anymore right now, but but that, that gives you a sense of, you know, uh, the spike that happened when we invoked the function. If I go back again and look at, uh, let's look at our consumer. Those were the maximum parts. I think it has, scale down one, two, three, four, five, six to still six, still working, still working on it. And here on the connector parts, the Keda connector parts, still one here. So I can actually go look at it. Yeah, there is just one part for R2F. Yeah, it's running a rabbit MQ. Uh, cool. So the idea is uh, when you are executing uh, workloads, uh, things should scale up on demand. When you're not doing anything, things should scale down backward, you know, nothing. Now, of course, I'm talking about pods. You must be asking, what about the underlying nodes? Uh, now, I didn't, you know, do for this demo like a node autoscaler, but you could very well back this with a node autoscaler and actually when there are no messages appearing from your you know, uh, sources, you could just run with one node cluster. And as messages arrive, you could actually scale it out to you know, two, three, or you know, as many number of nodes as you want, and, and you know, uh, accordingly process messages. All right, that's, that's gonna take, I think, a while. And uh, it'll, okay, now they are going into terminating state. There you go. So from running uh, to terminating, because it has probably processed all of them, I don't know why this is still still out to one. It should probably go back to zero. Hopefully in a minute or so. Great. So 
consumer ports for rabbitmq already gone back to kind of original state consumer port for kafka also gone back to more or less original state if i look at the producer terminating as well and if i look at the rabbit producer terminating as well right so all the function ports are pretty much in terminating state there is just one pod which is for connector which is still in you know uh, running state should go back to emitting state in a, in a while cool so that was you know a, a brief demo uh, the code walk through and uh, you know how this whole thing works how truly it is auto scaled not just from actual workload processing units but also the units which actually read a message to and supply you know to to the processing unit so to speak they are also auto scale using kada uh, so this is truly auto scalable and uh, you know only on demand scalable kind of setup with kada and fission great uh gaurav you want to speak out so if you're happy or if you're enlightened with what we have seen like this is just one example which vishal has demoed there are more examples that are available on the blogs on the documentation side and also on the fission examples so what you can do is try this example which takes in six functions and you what you play with is kafka redis and a database and also there has a web ui so vishal has already written a blog post about the same where he is describing the whole functions and yes this is something that we'll would we'll really like you to try and give us your feedback how you like it and if you have run into any issues we'll be more than happy to help you on the slack if you are starting your journey as a fresh contributor out of college or if you're already part of different communities and helping in different uh, projects we'll be happy to have you contribute to fission as well and yes definitely you just contributing to code is just one side contributing documentation raising issues and helping with questions in fact asking questions is just marvelous uh, way of uh, you know contributing so yes we would like to connect with you on slack or twitter wherever you feel like and just help us out with um, contributions to vision in fact if you are interested in contributing to just fission you can also start contributing to botcube so botcube is another project uh, which we started at infracloud this is a chat ops way of interacting with your kubernetes cluster it not just allows you to monitor your cluster but it also allows you to do some more fancy stuff like uh, creating deployments creating pods and all so yes this is also our open source project that you can start your journey with if you have any questions we'll be more than happy to take them and uh, if you have any questions even after this talk and all we will be available on slack so thank you very much for your time and we'll see you around